Hi, my name is Dave Haas. I'm a PhD candidate at Duke University Marine Lab, and I am studying uh, whale and dolphin ecophysiology, trying to develop a, basically a Fitbit for whales right now. Today, I'm gonna to be talking with you about killer whales. I'm gonna be talking with you about killer whales sort of generally all over the world to give you a big overview on the species. Uh, and then I'm gonna do a deeper dive uh, with you on killer whales in the Northeastern Pacific Ocean. So let's hop in. So as I'm talking with you about killer whales today, uh, this is going to be a recorded lecture, but if you have any questions about anything that I talk about during this lecture today, feel free to email me. My email address is dave.haas at duke.edu. You can see it in the lower left side of this slide. Uh, you can also tweet at me at Dave Haas. Uh, so yeah, we're going to get started. This is uh, a picture of some killer whales taken off the coast of California uh, during some work I did with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Uh, that's a part of NOAA back in uh, 2013, I think, were uh, the, the picture. These pictures were taken. So uh, cetaceans. Uh, as you have probably covered by now in marine megafauna, uh, constitute about 120 species total. The whales that are facing uh, to the right, uh, these animals here, like the blue whale and the fin whale or baleen whales, all of the animals that are facing to the left are toothed whales and killer whales are among those animals. Killer whales are actually uh, in the uh, family of delphinids, which includes animals like a bottlenose dolphin. Uh, they happen to be the largest of the uh, delphinid species, uh, although not the largest toothed whale overall. The largest adonisid is uh, the sperm whale. Um, they also come in uh, a tremendous variety of different forms, uh, which we call egotypes, uh, sometimes called morphs. Uh, I'm going to briefly run through some of these uh, different uh, uh, ecotypes that we see uh, in just a minute, but uh, I want to give you an overview just of, uh, sort of globally that killer whales are really a, a cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitan distribution with uh, basically any ocean basin that can support them with food. Uh, those killer, killer whales are going to be in those ocean basins, so uh, we have seen killer whales just about everywhere. Uh, in the world. Uh, they're apex predators, uh, ecologically speaking, uh, and they often have uh, coordinated, highly specialized foraging strategies that they use. This is a photo from Ingrid Visser of a killer whale chasing after a shark here. Uh, but they have great variation in the primary prey items that they'll go after. This is a, a photo from Paul Nicklin of the Norwegian killer whales. The, they uh, shoal up and use their tails to smash into these big herring balls. And then they just go and pick off the herring one piece at a time. Uh, but there have been video, uh, video evidence of killer whales uh, ganging up in larger groups and uh, doing uh, performing group uh, foraging uh, attempts on uh, things like blue whales, uh, fin whales, and some of the largest odontocetes in the world. I'm sorry, some of the largest baleen whales in the world, uh, often with poor success, but very interesting. Uh, killer whales are also, generally speaking, highly social. They often organize into these small, stable match lines between maybe two and ten animals. But we've also seen uh, killer whales aggregate into larger pods of up to 40 or 50 animals, uh, which we sometimes call super pods. They also have very long lifespans, uh, sort of analogous to human lifespan, uh, similar uh, age ranges. Uh, females are post-reproductive, going through menopause around 40 years of age, uh, and some of those uh, females are estimated to be uh, up to 80 to 100 years old, uh, although I think there's better support for maybe in the 60 to 80 range than the 80 to 100 range. Uh, some of the examples of this are shown in uh, the southern resident killer whales, which I'll talk with you about, where we actually have great photographic evidence of uh, some of these animals uh, being uh, documented uh, as far back as uh, the 1960s uh, and going forward and understanding how long they have been uh, uh, in a post-reproductive phase, not 
uh, having a calf with them, we can kind of back out uh, some some pretty long ages. So as an example, one of the uh, species, one of the pods I'll be talking with you about, the J pod, which are in the southern residence, uh, this uh, animal J two, nicknamed Granny, uh, was estimated by some to be between eighty and a hundred years old. Uh, there's very strong support that she was in her sixties at least uh, when she uh, appeared to when she stopped appearing with her pod a couple of years back and is now presumed dead. Uh, they also, uh, killer whales, have a wide range of acoustic vocalizations and whistles, uh, and in uh, some of the ecotypes, echolocations as well. Um, here is an example of a spectrogram. This is a, a specific type of a pulsed call uh, that only the L-pod, L12 matriline in the southern resident killer whale community uh, are known to produce. So it's very interesting that sometimes the acoustic calls of these animals can be identified down to a specific matriline of animals. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. And I'm also going to go ahead and play you now the uh, S2 type three call from the L12 matriline. Have a listen. So one of the uh, things I mentioned acoustically uh, that you can hear kill, uh, many of the ecotypes of killer whales do is use echolocation. And I don't know if you guys have seen this video, but I think it's a great demonstration of what echolocation is used for. In murky water, these animals uh, can't be visual predators necessarily, so they have to come up with a different strategy, and echolocation is one of them. This is not a killer whale echolocating, but I want you to hear what echolocation sounds like. Uh, this is a harbor porpoise coming in uh, on a fish. Have a listen. Killer whales use echolocation, uh, certainly in the southern resident killer whales, uh, which are, uh, well, it seems like pretty much exclusively fish eating uh, ecotype. So a bit more generally about killer whales, uh, killer whales demonstrate uh, a sexually dimorphic form. Uh, so you'll see males, once they reach puberty, their dorsal fin will uh, do what we call sprouting and can reach heights of up to about six feet, uh, a little uh, under two meters, while females and juveniles continue to have the smaller dorsal fin. Um, if you get a breaching killer whale, you can also tell, uh, you can sex the animal that way because there's some very distinct pigmentation differences. On the males, uh, you'll see there's a longer pigmentation stripe here. On, and on females, you'll actually see uh, mammary slits and a smaller uh, pigmentation spot. And then uh, the male's uh, white patch extends uh, further posteriorly towards the tail flukes. And finally, something else you can see in the wild, if you see curved tail flukes, that is a male killer whale, uh, whereas uh, the straight, uh, non-curved uh, tail surfaces, tail fluke surfaces, are indicative of uh, juveniles or females. So it's uh, not always a, a perfect uh, indicator, but there are a lot of clues if you can get a breaching animal and see its pigmentation and the tail flukes and the dorsal fin, it's a dead giveaway. So I mentioned that there are a lot of different ecotypes or morphs around the world, and uh, I just want to cover the southern hemisphere of animals. Uh, this really is uh, uh, talking specifically about the uh, animals that are around Antarctica, of which there are many, many forms. Uh, so the uh, type A uh, Antarctic killer whales are sort of a classic form of these, and they uh, feed on uh, animals like minke whales and large seals. Uh, they may do some migrations to uh, some of the lower latitudes. I do a lot of work in Brazil, go there a couple of times a year to do whale research, whale tagging. Uh, and we haven't encountered these animals in those tropical waters yet, although we do have some others. Um, there's also these guys, you probably have seen these on like a Nat Geo show, these uh, two-toned animals. They actually, when they're spending time down in Antarctica, they end up getting this diatom film in their skin, turn sort of this yellow color and then disappear for a period of time. And when they come back to Antarctica, when they migrate back to Antarctica to start feeding, they come back with these shiny new black and white and paint coats with this thing we call a dorsal cape here. Um, these animals, the ones you've seen on Nat Geo, are uh, the ones that do pack ice feeding. Uh, a lot of times you'll see those. Uh, and then there's another form with uh, this, the, both have these very large eye patches 
uh, both have dorsal capes, but there's a larger form that's the pack eyes feeder, and then the Galachi uh, straight killer whale, the smaller type B, and they are known to feed on uh, penguins, uh, although uh, their exact feeding ecology is less well studied. But this is a great picture of uh, one of the uh, type B's sizing up a uh, uh, dinner or a lunch option. Uh, that's got to be quite an intimidating sight if you are that seal on that ice flow. Um, there's another type called a Ross C killer whale, a type C, and they have these uh, uh, similar to the type B's with the, the dorsal ridge, the diatom film, uh, but they have this smaller eye patch that slopes uh, pretty uh, vigorously from down to up as it moves posterior along the animal's body. Uh, these are thought to be uh, fish-eating uh, killer whales. Uh, and then there's this other uh, type, the sub-Antarctic killer whale, or type Ds, about which very little is known. They're maybe the most unique-looking of the killer whale ecotypes uh, with a very blunt snout, it's a very, very reduced eye patch, and uh, very tall dorsal fins uh, uh, in comparison to uh, the uh, other ecotypes that you see around Antarctica. These animals were only known uh, since the 1950s uh, after a mass stranding in New Zealand in 1955. Here are some of the type C's with their sloped eye, uh, eye patch uh, uh, back in Antarctica. Uh, flipping over to the, uh, the Atlantic, uh, we have the, a uh, couple of different forms there. There's a smaller form. I mentioned the herring, uh, uh, the killer whales in Norway that feed on herring. There's this smaller Eastern North Atlantic type one, and then a larger, uh, form, a type two Eastern North Atlantic. Uh, again, these are sort of thought to be, uh, divided into herring feeders versus animals that feed on minke whales. The larger, uh, whales seem to support a larger morph. Um, I mentioned that I do a lot of work in Brazil and we've also seen a number of killer whales down there and we've tried to get some genetic, uh, just some uh, genetic biopsies of these animals uh, with very limited success uh, to try and figure out what these ecotypes are. This is one from uh, last July or August when I was down in Brazil that gave us a close approach and on this day uh, we had maybe 100 of uh, a type of baleen whale called a say whale. They're the third longest baleen whale uh, type. And uh, we had about 100 to 150 say whales and a small pod of about seven killer whales uh, in the area. And we think we may have just missed some predation happening, but uh, great photo uh, from a great day uh, in Brazil last year. So in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, on uh, uh, the, the Northeastern Pacific, these are the animals that I have the most experience with, uh, and I'll be talking with you about them uh, in uh, the following order, is offshore killer whales, bigs or transient killer whales, and resident killer whales. Generally, sort of, this is a cartoon depiction of uh, how this works, is there, there's an offshore population, as the name might suggest, uh, a transient population that works along the coast, and then these, you know, so-called resident populations that are very inshore animals. Um, all three of these teeth are from different adult killer whales from the northeastern Pacific, and they all had an age that, that ranged between about 20 and 25 years. But what I draw your attention to is the different form of these teeth. So transients or bigs killer whales, residents with a, a taller, uh, less curved tooth, and then these offshore teeth, which are worn down uh, pretty substantially. Uh, and then again, on the morph form, you can actually see, whoops, sorry about that. You can also see here, uh, there's some differences across the ecotypes, uh, the offshore killer whale, the resident killer whale, and the transient killer whale, or uh, big killer whale, all have different looking dorsal fins. So these are uh, clues that we can use when we see these animals that may give us some immediate uh, kind of notification of the type of ecotype that we're working with when we're out on the water with them. So the first ones I want to talk with you about are offshore killer whales. And these are smaller, uh, they're less observed because they uh, kind of cruise out over the outer continental shelf in the uh, eastern North Pacific. Um, we've had group sizes that are pretty large with these species, uh, with this ecotype, sorry, uh, ranging from, you know, uh, anywhere from really 50 to 200 uh, and kind of spread out all over the place when we run into those groups. 
Uh, we've seen this, uh, these guys anywhere between Alaska and Southern California. And one of the reasons that their teeth are so worn down, as I showed in the previous slide, is because they feed on sharks. Uh, the shark skin, if you've not seen it up close, is uh, made of uh, a, a type of uh, almost scale or tooth-like material uh, called a denticle. Uh, this denticle helps the sharks uh, keep a very hydrodynamic profile. Uh, but it's also incredibly rough. You can imagine chewing on a tooth-like substance. You can imagine why the teeth on offshore killer whales might get ground down. This is some acoustics from offshore killer whales that we collected in uh, 2013 during an encounter with uh, a pod of about 50 in uh, March of 2013. Uh, so John Ford, who's uh, one of the sort of grandfathers of uh, killer whale research in the northeastern Pacific, uh, and his collaborators uh, were out with a number of uh, offshore killer whales. And on this particular day, these white tri uh, these white diamonds that you see are all uh, documented uh, uh, observations of offshore killer whales. Uh, uh, preying on Pacific sleeper sharks on this particular day. So these animals were sort of just working along this area, uh, gobbling up sharks uh, all through the day. Here is a Pacific sleeper shark. And again, drawing your attention to the different tooth morphology from residents to transients to offshores in, in this uh, offshore uh, adult animal. Those teeth are uh, worn down to the gum line, which is pretty remarkable. It makes you think about what kind of foraging strategies these animals might have to employ. If, uh, if you were a 20 or a 30 year old adult and you don't have teeth, who's doing the work of uh, sharing the prey with you if you're not able to capture it yourself? So it's a pretty interesting thing. And uh, unfortunately, these are just really, really difficult animals for us to study because of the places that they spend their time and the conditions in the Northeastern Pacific. It's not often amenable to uh, us getting out there in small boats to work with these guys. So these are some pictures from that March 8th encounter we had with the offshore killer whales off the coast of Washington State uh, around uh, Gray's Canyon. Uh, we had about uh, two uh, sort of groups of 25, a total of about 50. And one of the things we noticed when we were out with these animals is that relative to resident killer whales that we encounter, the transient the killer whales that we encounter, uh, in the northeastern Pacific, these animals are kind of more torn up. They have pretty rough dorsal fins. They have scrapes and uh, on their bodies, and they just kind of look really tough. One of the other things I found interesting in this photo, uh, although we don't typically see sort of a dorsal cape, on these particular animals that day, I did happen to get a uh, nice photo uh, down near the waterline, and I was able to make out a dorsal uh, a dorsal cape on these uh, animals. So. Uh, it would be fantastic if we could get out there and spend more time with them, but we just have to be, unfortunately, in the right place at the right time, and that's pretty hard to do to learn more about that species or more about that ecotype. So uh, next, I want to talk with you about transients or Biggs killer whales. Uh, transients uh, uh, are known as Biggs killer whales because of this guy, Mike Big, who is one of the uh, early proponents of... Uh, studying killer whales and uh, uh, developing a new technique called photo ID, where we can take a picture of a killer whale's dorsal fin on the right and the left sides and use this distinctive pigmented area and the shape of the dorsal fin and any distinctive notches in the dorsal fin uh, to identify that animal, almost like a fingerprint. So uh, he uh, proposed this ideas and was uh, laughed at and it's now sort of just, a, it's a de facto tool that uh, cetacean researchers use to identify animals at an individual level uh, and in species that we can study from year to year it's been become an in, indispensable tool for understanding how population demographics work in in cetaceans uh, so bigs or transient killer whales are the mammal eaters of the north northeastern pacific they're the largest of the morphs and again these guys will eat uh, just about everything we see them eating a lot of seals sea lions uh, uh, we have seen them in the Northeastern Pacific go after uh, minke whales and gray whales. Um, as I mentioned in Brazil, I've seen uh, mammal eaters go after say whales, and uh, we suspect they're going after uh, Brutus whales as well. Uh, 
Um, the tooth morphology that I mentioned is really interesting for these, uh, this ecotype. We see this curved uh, tooth, which uh, may uh, help them sort of hold on to elusive uh, prey that's fighting back. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, ecological uh, uh, evolutionary uh, adaptation uh, for the type of foraging that these animals may be doing. Uh, this is an example of a, a northeastern Pacific uh, mammal-eating killer whale. Uh, I just can't get over the height of these animals. This is going after a bottlenose dolphin. This is actually not in uh, the northeastern Pacific in the area that I've worked before, but it is in uh, ba just off the coast of Baja, California. So this sort of energetic approach of bashing prey with its body, swimming fast, is definitely something that we have observed as well in the Northeastern Pacific species. We've done some work with the, these research tools called D-tags. These are non-invasive suction cup attached tags. Uh, I use these all the time. Uh, the, the tags have uh, pressure sensors and temperature sensors so that we can measure depth. Uh, three axis accelerometers and magnetometers so we can measure kinematics to talk about how the animal's body is pitching and rolling and moving around with respect to magnetic north. And then hydrophones has a stereo hydrophone so we can actually hear the animal's echolocating or chasing prey. And then this uh, long VHF uh, transmitter here uh, so that we can recover the tag after it comes off of the whale. Uh, and that was a picture of Mark Johnson, who is the co-creator of the D-tag. This is a picture of the D-tag uh, attached to one of the uh, killer whales that we've worked with in the Northeastern Pacific, just to give you an idea of how big a tag looks uh, in uh, scale to uh, a, a, a dorsal fin. And this is what it likes, looks like to actually put one of these D-tags on, whale comes up, pop, just kind of poke it right onto the animal. So we uh, put a D-tag on a transient killer whale. This is T65A2. He was a sub-adult male born in 2004. And on the, uh, in September of 2014, we were able to get a D-tag on this uh, particular animal as he swam with his uh, mom and his uh, younger siblings. And this is an example of the kind of data that you can get from a D-tag. So the green dot over here is the start of this tag deployment, and the red dot is the end of this tag deployment. And that constitutes a total of about seven point, it's about, it's about seven and three quarter hours of, of uh, time, of tag on time, where the tag was on the animal. And during that time, we uh, were able to observe uh, three different predation events. Uh, as this animal was wearing the tag. And again, these are transients or mammal-eating killer whales. So uh, some interesting things that we were able to get from this using the, the pitch, roll, and heading is that these animals are not really diving very deep. You can see sort of maximum depth from this. This is just one dive where the animal started out on a dive here. And what we can see, this color that you see here is the roll of the animal. So the animal, this uh, T65A2 is sort of doing a lot of rolling from right to left, right to left, and doing visual searching. So we think that uh, these animals are, are just uh, basically being silent visual predators where they go for a dive and uh, move from right to left looking up uh, into the sunlight to see if they can spot prey. And they're probably actively listening as well to give them further clues about what their foraging ecology looks like. This is an actual pseudo track. Uh, this is a, a dive profile of a predation event with T65A2. Uh, and the dive began here. T65A2 began his descent down to a depth of just about 20 meters, uh, sort of rolled here, uh, we believe probably to get a, a good visual fix on an animal, uh, and then uh, began swimming rapidly. And I'm gonna play some acoustics and you can just hear what this sounds like to actually have it, uh, the, what the tag actually sounds like as the water is flowing and this animal is swimming fast to uh, uh, go for a kill. And 
that sound you hear is the animal actually colliding with uh, a harbor porpoise on that particular day. Uh, that animal uh, sort of burst out of the water and we were able to observe, you know, a big splash and a harbor porpoise body. And then shortly after that, uh, we saw both T65A1 and T65A2, the tagged whale, uh, do another set of dives and uh, attacking this harbor porpoise. And then uh, that predation event was pre was over pretty quickly. Um, and we were able to uh, uh, hear all of that and see all of that with the DTAG data. So one of the jokes we have is transients only talk with their mouths full. Uh, uh, this is a picture of T65A1, our detagged whale's mom, carrying a harbor porpoise in her mouth. Um, but we uh, continuously on the DTAG records really find that the transient killer whales, I played that echolocation sound of the harbor porpoise earlier where it was getting the fish, we don't hear transient killer whales using echolocation at all. Uh, they really are silent visual predators actively listening but not using echolocation to find their prey. Um, so they're very quiet animals, and we see this in the DTAG record of our tagged transient whale, where we really only hear them vocalize after a kill has been made. So the joke about them talking with their mouths full. So those are transients, or big killer whales, but uh, now I'm going to move on and talk with you about the animals uh, that I have worked with the most, which are southern resident killer whales. Uh, this is some video we took when we were working with them off the coast of, I believe this is off the coast of Washington uh, in 2015, in uh, late February or early March. So that was again the L12 matcher line. I played the S2 type 3 call to you uh, sort of near the beginning of this lecture. And that was the L12 matcher line, which uh, uh, of all of the killer whales seemed to just love to come up to the small boat the most. So we have a lot of uh, fun encounters with, the, with the, that matcher line. So again, resident killer whales, they have a, a more upright tooth, a less curved tooth compared to the transients. They're a slightly smaller size than the transient killer whales. Um, they also have uh, what we call an open saddle patch. So the saddle patch is very, uh, typically has some openness to it uh, and it makes it distinct uh, a lot of times from uh, transient or offshore killer whales. And then they always, uh, uh, the females and the juveniles tend to have this more uh, rounded uh, tr pointed trailing tip compared to transients, which have a more almost sort of shark-like uh, aspect to it. And then we see in the residence, there's also uh, the tall dorsal fin sometimes can be forward slanted with a wavy trailing edge compared to the, uh, the transient killer whales. So in resident killer whales in the northeastern Pacific, the primary prey item is uh, salmon and some of the, uh, some of the demersal fish. Uh, and then some of the residents have even been known to be uh, squid specialists in some of the western Alaskan resident communities. Uh, speaking of communities, I just want to give you a sense of the resident uh, communities here. So there are kind of five resident communities that stretch from the Bering Sea uh, uh, and the Aleutian Islands up into Alaska and then down along the coast of British Columbia into Can uh, in Canada and down into the United States. Uh, I have uh, only had the uh, pleasure to work with uh, resident, uh, southern residents and then on maybe one day northern residents. 
But the communities are very interesting because there's no evidence of interbreeding, even though these animals share habitats. So the southern residents and the northern residents overlap in this area. And then you can see these cross hatched areas here where the different Alaskan resident communities uh, over have, have geographic overlap. We don't see evidence of genetic overlap or acoustic overlap between those communities at all. Um, as I mentioned, the focus of most of my research has been on that southern resident killer whale community. And uh, I need to update this slide, but uh, the southern resident community is now down to 72 animals. Uh, and that's made up of three different pods. And then with each pod, uh, the pods have matrilines where uh, a matriarch uh, has her sons and daughters and then uh, all of the daughter's uh, offspring as well uh, typically make up a matriline. So southern resident killer whales uh, were thought to be more abundant uh, prior to 1960, but in, the, in, in between 1962 and 1973, they were the target of a live legal captive fishery. Uh, this is a picture from the Penn Cove uh, roundup of, killer whale, of uh, southern resident killer whales in the 60s. And uh, during this time, these animals were penned in and uh, targeted for capture, and in particular, the calves and the juveniles, the smallest animals, were targeted for capture. And during that period of time, at least 45 animals, from largely from the southern resident killer whale population, although some northern residents were taken as well, um, were taken, and uh, uh, some were taken and some died in the process. Uh, and by the time the first population survey happened in 1971, there were uh, a, it, there were 67 known southern resident killer whales left, and that was probably uh, from a high of maybe 95 to 100 uh, prior to that. So during this period where the live captive fishery was happening, uh, the population plummeted to, 19, six, uh, to 67 until protections were put in place to uh, uh, forbid the live active fishery from continuing to take southern residents uh, from the waters around Seattle and Victoria and Vancouver. Um, and the population sort of sprung back over a period of time. There's uh, some demographic shifts here, uh, but by 1995, it looked like the population was sort of well on its way to recovery uh, and back to numbers that predated, we think, because the animals weren't being fully census before 1965, uh, but they looked about on par with where they were at before the live active fishery uh, went into place. Uh, and then unfortunately in 1995, the population fell by uh, almost 20 animals. Uh, and there was great concern about, uh, are these animals, uh, you know, are these animals gonna go extinct? These are an iconic species in the Seattle and Victoria and Vancouver areas in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, in uh, 19, in 2005, uh, the animals ended up getting listed as endangered in the US and 2004 as threatened uh, in, uh, Canada under the SARA Act, the Species at Risk Act. And the, the population numbers really just kind of bounced around between, you know, 80 and 90, but never really showing any kind of a, a strong uptick in a favorable direction in spite of those recovery efforts. And, and more recently and more troubling, these numbers are actually down to uh, almost down to the original uh, numbers we saw when the surveys began. The current southern resident population is down to 72 animals as of this year. Um, so again, to give you an idea, the northern resident community is uh, known to use this area for habitat, where the, whereas the southern resident community uh, extends all the way down to almost San Francisco. Uh, and you can see, uh, this is an old slide here, but between, you know, up to 2012, the northern resident community was really continuing to grow while the southern resident community was struggling. And in fact, the northern resident population as of right now, it has experienced since 1974, uh, a 250% growth, and they now total over 310 as of today. Um, uh, northern residents uh, across a bunch of different pods, and I won't go deep into that. And unfortunately, the southern population, southern resident population, really hasn't. Um, we're seeing sort of this, you know, uh, compared to uh, where we were at in 1995, kind of a, a, a decline with some, you know, hopeful peaks every once in a while. But uh, even this, this is in. Uh, there's a, a big baby boom in the southern resident uh, killer whale community. 
Uh, but unfortunately, between that baby boom in 2015 and today, when the population is now down to 72, um, only one of the 10 calves that were born yeah, since that baby boom in 2015 have survived to reach a juvenile uh, age class. And there's been very little reproductive success on the side of the Southern residents. Uh, and this is uh, continuing to be a cause of great concern. Uh, so we have a couple of hypotheses about why the recovery is stalled for Southern residents. Uh, and the first uh, hypothesis is uh, prey limitation, is there maybe are just not finding enough food. So I mentioned the baby boom that happened with the Southern residents. And this is one of the babies that was born during that period of time. This is J50 who was born sort of towards the end of that baby boom. And in 2017, using drone imagery, we were able to look at all of these animals and J, uh, J50 looked really good. Uh, but by August of 2018, uh, J50's body was much thinner. Um, and we see this kind of over and over and over again with these animals where they'll exhibit, it's, uh, uh, we just call it, uh, it's called peanut head, but there's this fat area, this the nuchal fold uh, that is posterior of the animal's blowhole. And we can actually see these animals' body condition slowly deteriorate over time. Uh, so trying to figure out, are these animals finding enough food is there enough food in the water is one of the big hypotheses that we've been trying to test and, and figure out is, is prey limitation the reason or one of the reasons that these animals may not be recovering. So this uh, picture on the left here, this is Brad Hansen who leads the Southern Resident Killer Whale Scientific Team uh, at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Brad has the uncanny ability to peer into the water and see, you know, uh, the tiniest pieces of fish scales and fish tissues, which we scoop out with a dip net. Here's one of the salmon scales that was collected after a predation event by a Southern residence that had been uh, going after Chinook salmon. Uh, uh, so we get these uh, scales and send them back to the lab uh, and are, we're able to do DNA sequencing on this. And the science on this has become remarkable since the 2005 uh, listing of Southern residents. We are now able to go and gather these uh, scale samples. And we can actually figure out now down to almost a river basin level, what species of salmon and which river basin those salmon are associated with. In doing this work, we've been able to make the determination that Southern residents consume uh, primarily Shuduk salmon. It makes up over 75% of their summer diet in their core habitat. Uh, and then there are smaller slices for other types of fish uh, in there, some sockeye salmon, coho, chum salmon, and steelhead. But in the core summer habitat, the area that has always pri primarily been their core summer habitat, and the area that's listed as critical habitat for southern resident killer whale, Chinook is overwhelmingly the fish that they'll go after. So one of the problems with that is salmon returns have been pretty lousy. We started to see uh, salmon returns uh, falling uh, down to pretty low levels starting in 1990. Uh, and in particular, Chinook salmon returns falling, uh, you know, in the late 1980s and really never recovering. Um, and that's pretty alarming for a species that is you know, an ecotype that's relying on, you know, 75 or 80 percent of uh, its uh, foraging energy. Uh, and they can't get that primary prey item that they're looking for. So I tried to look at this in terms of, is this an El Nino effect or a Pacific Decadal Oscillation effect or some combination or a combination with lags? But, but there's really no single signal that we can say, oh, you know, there's, some, there's some sort of uh, process happening that's driving that salmon problem, that's driving the lack of Chinook salmon returns for Southern residents. So it's, it's, a, it's quite a tricky problem. Chinook salmon itself is an endangered species also, uh, and the salmon runs uh, that uh, these the southern resident killer whales are targeting include the Fraser River salmon that uh, come in this direction and head into the Fraser River this way. Um, so the numbers are declining there. They also rely on Columbia River salmon, and there are issues there, and then further south, the Sacramento River. Um, and then there's also comp competition happening here. So as salmon come in this way that may be going up the Fraser River, the Northern resident community is in a perfect place to pick off those salmon before they ever make it into Southern resident habitat. So Southern residents are kind of under two pieces of, two different kinds of pressure here. There's competitive pressure from Northern residents 
coming with salmon coming this way. And then there's a problem with salmon returns generally uh, in this region. So we wanted to really understand habitat use uh, and we started using a thing called satellite tags. So uh, we put the first satellite tag on an adult male killer whale. He was a sub-adult male at the time, K25. He was a member of the K-Pod group and uh, we popped a satellite tag on him a few days after Christmas in 2012, about 50 miles north of Seattle. And that uh, satellite tag was set to transmit daily for the first month and then switch to an every other day uh, mode so that it can serve battery power uh, because we were going to head out into the northeastern Pacific during the winter for something called the pods or the Pacific or sinus distribution survey or sinus work is the scientific name for killer whales. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see where they were at. So this is a uh, video uh, from Greg Shore firing the satellite tag here onto K25's dorsal fin. So you can see the satellite tag there. K25 ended up leaving the Seattle area and by January 10th had moved all the way down to San Francisco. So as a reminder, that was December 29th when the tag went on. And then by uh, January 10th, the animal had made, the animal and presumably the rest of its pod mates had made it all the way down to Point Reyes, California, which is just outside of uh, San Francisco. So quite a bit of ground covered by these animals. And this really gave us, we had some good anecdotal evidence that these animals were uh, being seen down in California, but we didn't have great scientific evidence in the form of satellite tag data to back that up. So we were able to get out uh, on the Pacific or sinus distribution survey for just 11 days. We were impacted by a government shutdown, but we were able to spend a lot of time off the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington uh, with those animals during that period of time. And what we really saw a lot of were these animals working. Um, these are the satellite tagged animal again, uh, working in this area here. And we observed the animals looking uh, uh, for, uh, for fish to eat, but we really weren't observing predation events happening. Uh, and I apologize for this. We had uh, about 21 days in 2015 in February and March, uh, again, aboard the Bell Shimada, where we were able to go out on a 2015 pods cruise. And on that particular campaign, we ended up having much better luck. We were able to spend the first week with J-Pod, where we, and we found J-Pod sort of all the way up to this area uh, along the coast, the inner coast of uh, Vancouver Island. And then we headed out and encountered uh, a K and L pod, and we were able to follow them uh, up and down the coast of uh, of California, Oregon, and Washington. So satellite tags really helped us understand habitat use. They were able to help us get right out to the animals. Uh, we were able to satellite tag a number of different animals from J, K, and L pods to understand how each of those pods were using habitat. And recently, the data from those uh, cruises uh, and acoustic uh, presence where we put acoustic buoys out, prey sampling data, it's all helped support a petition to expand critical habitat. And this is something I'm happy to see happening. Uh, the new proposed critical habitat, the old critical habitat was really just this core use area. This was sort of summer and fall habitat, but because we knew very, very little about where, what, uh, how these animals are spending their time the other six months out of the year, the work that we did uh, starting in 2013 uh, and really before that as well, but uh, a lot of the work that we did in 2013 to 2016 has helped support this expansion of critical habitat for Southern residents to, to include the areas that they're using. Uh, and that will hopefully give NOAA some, some extra tools uh, in its belt to uh, maybe regulate uh, salmon recovery, which might help uh, put more fish in the water for these animals, uh, maybe removing dams where dams are actually blocking salmon from moving upstream and moving downstream. Uh, and those things may be affecting those salmon populations. We have another hypothesis that we also needed to test, which is uh, whether or not contaminants play a role here. So this is another image of Brad uh, firing a, uh, a biopsy rifle. And you can see he fires this little biopsy dart. There's this little white uh, uh, white in, uh, line here, uh, just to the lower right side of this uh, killer whale dorsal fin. Up close, that's what this looks like. The biopsy dart, which you can see here, will make its way into the animal. It bounces into the animal, 
collects a small amount of skin and blubber and then falls into the water. And then we can recover it with a dip net. And you can see here is a blubber sample. And then we can send it to the lab and basically do a tox screen, a toxicology screen on the blubber sample. And we've seen some interesting trends uh, rise over uh, the years as we've been collecting more and more biopsy samples. Um, to start with, I want to draw your attention to this. This is uh, uh, PCBs are a type of uh, uh, environmental toxin, uh, a persistent organic pollutant. And you can see that this, this uh, line here, this blue line, this blue horizontal line, is a number that's known to cause uh, uh, health problems in mammals, generally speaking. And you can see that that line, uh, that the, the samples that we've taken from Southern Resident Killer Whales from JK and LPOD have regularly showing uh, levels well above that sort of lower limit where we know health negative health effects can, can become uh, a problem uh, where uh, PCBs can create negative health effects. Um, Interestingly, though, we've also seen other uh, persistent organic pollutants uh, uh, with some really curious patterns. So we also wanted to look at DDT, which was banned uh, uh, in the uh, 20th century, uh, but continues to persist. And we saw these differential patterns where J-Pod didn't uh, have as much DDT in their skin and blubber samples. K-Pod had more and L-Pod had quite a bit more. Um, whereas uh, PBDs, these are flame retardants, we saw sort of higher levels of that across the board in J-Pod and lower levels in K&L pod. And these originally, you know, kind of prior to 2013, th these were mysteries to us. Is why would we see these patterns? But it really, now that we know more about habitat use, especially winter habitat use, we understand that J-Pod is spending a lot more time in core habitat where PCBs are a problem. Um, so we see across the board these, uh, I'm sorry, we see PCBs across the board. This is sort of high levels for both animals. And there are big PCB outflows from Sacramento rivers and then some of the river systems uh, in like the Duwamish River in uh, King County, which is where Seattle's at in Washington state. Um, different pattern for DDT because of the agriculture uh, in California, there were big runoffs of DDT, and uh, it's not surprising with those runoffs that those levels might be higher in L-Pod, which spends a lot more time uh, along the California coast compared to, say, J-Pod, which still has, you know, decently high levels, but not nearly as high. Um, and then similarly, PBDEs, we see a lot of PBDE runoff uh, in the Pacific Northwest and uh, seeing those higher signal levels in J-Pod, it starts to make sense. Um, one of the interesting things to be thinking about is the effects of these PCBs and how that may not just affect one animal, but it might uh, spread uh, to the uh, to the others. Uh, this is an interesting thing to look at is PCB concentrations across the different types of ecotypes that we encounter. So this is a Biggs male killer whale, and the PCB levels are quite high in this animal. This is uh, approaching 250 parts per million. Um, and then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is a, right, fourth bar is the transient mature male. So that's this one approaching 250. Um, Northern residents have much, much lower values. So it's an interesting thing that habitat use, uh, the type of habitat that these animals are using for foraging may be having outsized influences. So Northern resident killer whales are eating animals that are already high in the food chain. They're very high on the trophic, uh, trophic levels. So. Uh, the uh, bioaccumulation of print of uh, of uh, uh, PCBs uh, can cause these levels to go very high in animals that are regularly eating seal, sea lions, and porpoise, which are already highly bioaccumulated with PCBs. Northern residents, on the other hand, are in some more pristine waters, less habited area, lower PCB concentrations going into the water. So thinking about why these animals may end up having lower things and why recovery might be happen happening these may be some kind of a, a load on these uh, on southern residents that northern residents aren't experiencing. I also wanted to draw your attention to uh, northern resident reproductive aged females. So this this animal probably had likely given birth to a calf and whatever load she may have had probably looked a lot like this fell off. But in large part, that's probably because she transferred a lot of those PCBs uh, in her in uh, milk to her calf. So the calves are uh, also getting these big loads 
once they're born, uh, most of these uh, persistent organic pollutants are uh, fat-soluble compounds, so they're going to transfer in milk, um, and in the event that these animals start starving, they're going to have to burn blubber, and the PCBs and other or persistent organic pollutants are going to be sequestered in that blubber, and as they metabolize that blubber, those toxins are going to be released uh, into the bloodstream. So as the animal is starving, it may also be experiencing some kind of toxin stress. So this is a, a mature southern resident killer whale for comparison. We can see these numbers approaching almost 150 parts per million of PCBs compared to just under 40. Uh, and these are animals with similar diets but different habitat. And we wonder if those contaminants really matter, if these are stressing the animals out, uh, if they're starting to starve, is it just putting them at, low, at a higher risk of infection? We've seen some situations where transients have been tagged before uh, and had a really hard time healing up. Um, recently, we had a, an encounter. Uh, I was not on this cruise. I was working in Brazil that year, but we had an encounter in 2016 uh, with L95 Nigel and uh, he had a satellite tag attached to him uh, on the 23rd of February and was found dead a short time later, uh, necropsied, uh, which is a, a, an animal autopsy basically, on April 1st. Uh, and you can see the barbs where the, the satellite tag penetrated the skin. Uh, and the necropsy revealed uh, a type of fungal infection at the tagging site, which had spread into the blood vessels and into the lungs. And the question is, is was the satellite tagging barb, the, the avenue for infection, was the animal at risk because of toxin loads? Uh, or was he just at the end of his life? 20 years is starting to get into that range where we do see mortality happening. He was probably, you know, probably compromised in other ways. He was not in great body condition. But if there's a combination of nutritional stress and uh, toxin loads, and then uh, a fungal infection was added on top of that. Is it possible that uh, that the the combination of all of those things is leading to premature death and failure to to reproduce in some of these animals? Um, so these are big questions uh, we have going forward. One of the things we would like to be able to do is to figure out how we can perform these kinds of long-term non-invasive satellite tags uh, uh, on cetacean species, things where we don't have to use barbs. Finally, we've also been looking a lot at anthropogenic noise and uh, in core summer habitat for southern resident killer whales, these animals are encountering vessels quite a bit. So a lot of the work that we do with the, the digital acoustic tag, the DTAG work, has been in this area. And you can see in these areas here, these animals may have 100 to 200 encounters with vessels during the day. This is a great panoramic shot. It was taken from San Juan Island, but you can see all of these boats out here. And most of these boats are whale watch boats. That's our research vessel there. And then you'll see these little pockets here and here and here of killer whale dorsal fins poking up out of the water. And on any given day, we would see as many whale watch boats as we would see individual killer whales. We may have a pod of 25 killer whales and 25 whale watch boats plus, plus pleasure craft. Um, and we've observed that these animals uh, change their behavior in the presence of boats. So they spend less time foraging when there are boats around, uh, which is bad. We need these animals to be eating as much as they can if we think that prey limitation is a problem. Um, and we also see them traveling more, um, spending more time uh, moving uh, when they're in the presence of boats. Uh, so boat traffic is having some significant effects on these animals. And there have recently been some, uh, some pretty strong efforts to prevent uh, boat uh, activity, uh, and to limit boat activity around these core summer habitat areas uh, to try and help give these animals a little bit of a break. Just to give you an example, this is some work my colleagues at the Northwest Fishery Science Center did. This is a, a, a K33 is the 33 icon that you see there. And these are just some of the boats that we saw around that animal. And as the animal is swimming, the boats just continually follow that animal and its pod mates and continue to do this kind of all day long. As long as there are animals around, there are boats around. And it's really only until the animal makes a break for it and starts to head out into the deeper waters of the Strait of Juan de, Juan de Fuca, away from the islands, that those start to fall off. And at a certain point, it's basically down to, to just us and the, uh, and the actual tagged animal. So, 
Uh, great animation, though, for sort of understanding this, you know, uh, kind of, you know, constant harassment that these animals receive. It's kind of a constant low-level harassment, and it's a, and it's a difficult concern, right? If uh, we want to raise conservation awareness, showing people these animals and, and uh, making them appreciate, uh, you know, the tight-knit uh, social matra lines, the beauty of these animals, this iconic species in the Pacific Northwest, whale watching is part of that story. Uh, and the, a lot of the people do a, a great job of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem if we know that it's affecting their behavior. Um, we also wanted to look at how does uh, Southern resident killer whale subsurfacing behavior uh, vary. Uh, so we've used digital acoustic tags. Again, this is a D tag here on a Southern resident killer whale coming up. Uh, uh, so uh, myself and uh, some of my colleagues, uh, recent, we recently published uh, something on this. We wanted to uh, figure out whether we could use the acoustics from uh, the DTAG records to figure out whether these animals were foraging or not, uh, how often they were foraging and what years they were foraging, uh, and to get some idea of what foraging uh, efficiency and foraging success looked like. So to do this, uh, we use the acoustics that come off of the D-tags uh, and uh, uh, it took a tool, uh, kind of custom developed a tool to do this work where we looked at echolocation signals. So killer whales, southern resident killer whales echolocate, oh, echolocate to find their food. These, these uh, vertical lines that you see here are individual echolocation clicks. So our tagged whale, we know that a tag, when the tag is on the tagged whale, the tag stays in one orientation. So we can see these echolocation clicks that stay in this sort of minus 20 degree angle of arrival uh, line. This is very, very likely our tagged whale. We can look at the photo of where, how the tag is on the animal's body um, and look at these, uh, uh, look for these sort of stable echolocation lines in the acoustic record and the angle of arrival. Um, whereas we can see here other whales that are swimming around them, the angle of arrival of those echolocation clicks will change as the animals pass to the left and the right, above and below, and changing their, the angle of arrival of those echolocation clicks. So knowing that we had the tagged whales echolocation clicks, we were able to go through and score those and listen uh, as the animal was clicking and identify actual sounds of prey handling where there were tearing or crunching or bone snapping sounds in the acoustic records. And I'm going to play you an example of that. This is a, 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 another uh, K pod. This is another uh, K25 was the tagged animal here. And you're going to hear an S16, which is a stereotypic call for a K pod. And then you're going to hear some crunching and tearing sounds. Have a listen. So hopefully you're able to hear that. But we were able to go through and score all of the records that we had um, and figure out how these animals are using echolocation to target prey and find prey deep in the water and then capture the prey. And in this particular example, we actually had uh, confirmed uh, prey samples four different times on this particular day with this particular tagged animal. Again, this is K25 of K-Pod. We were able to also detect on many of these dives prey handling sounds. So we think at the terminal phase of the dive, where we see these fast clicks turning into buzzes, that these are the actual moments of prey capture. And then as the animal ascends, we hear more of those sounds of prey handling. And we think that there is quite a bit of prey sharing that may be happening there. So we looked at this across a number of different tag deployments, and we saw some general trends arise where um, we ended up in 2011, we just had just the animals were not echolocating. We were not seeing prey samples at the surface where the animals were bringing salmon to the surface. Other years were much better, better results in 2012, better results in 2014, um, and some decent parts, but not great in, in 20, uh, 2010, the first year. But it, it helped us really uh, the, the, using this DTAG records really helped us understand uh, how these animals are using these slow echolocation clicks on repeated dives, uh, these shallow dives where they're just sort of initially doing a search for prey. And we see this, the green here, these are the slow echolocations where it's just click, click, 
click, basically sending out some echolocation signals trying to find out if there's some salmon somewhere around. And then as the animal begins its pursuit of prey, we can see these, these fast clicks where they'll, uh, the clicks are between 10 and 100 milliseconds apart uh, until finally you end up with uh, uh, a buzz, which is typically found on the deep dives in terminal pursuit of the prey. Um, and so we've used that to really uh, effectively measure foraging effort and then uh, using prey handling sounds, that crunching and tearing sound, um, as, as a, an actual uh, marker for a predation event. And then in those cases where we've actually been able to get a prey sample, we can say we know for sure they were using going after a, a Fraser River Chinook salmon. So those are great. Uh, we think we have some good ideas now about, about prey capture, and that's probably you know, prey sharing happening at a matriline level where animals from a matriline are, are sharing that food. Um, and that the co-occurrence of buzzes and prey handling are pretty good proxies now for foraging success, which is a fantastic result to get out of, out of this. Um, I mentioned that we also know that uh, vessel traffic and noise levels uh, may, have, may be having some effects. And uh, Juliana Houghton, working with uh, my colleagues at Northwest Fisheries Science Center, were able to show uh, using DTAG acoustics also that the louder, the faster a boat goes, the more noise it's putting into uh, the system and the more those uh, speed and noise levels go up, uh, it has quite an effect on uh, killer whale behavior. Uh, this is kind of an obvious result, but it's an important one and it uh, strongly supports having some kind of speed uh, restrictions to keep noise down in critical habitat. And then finally, we were able to take the D tag and, and uh, uh, Jennifer Tennyson did a postdoc with uh, my colleagues at Northwest Fisheries Science Center and used the DTAG acoustics, uh, uh, used the results of the DTAG acoustics where we uh, figured out foraging, uh, when foraging was happening. And she looked at the kinematics, the pitch, roll, and heading, and a bunch of different variables that you can get out of the DTAG uh, to figure out. Uh, uh, if you could just use the kinematic, the movement signatures that come from a digital acoustic tag uh, to figure out whether uh, uh, there were some distinct kinematic signatures for foraging. And she was able to see that jerk, which is a type of kinematic signature, and roll and heading are similar across three different dive detection methods. Uh, and that the prey capture dives are, are actually kinematically distinct, that uh, the, the dives that come out as kinematically distinct are ones that we were able to uh, associate with ones we had previously identified as having uh, prey handling and prey capture sounds in them. Um, we also were able to show that foraging behavior differed by sex. Um, so males are uh, spending, uh, uh, they're uh, having more prey captures per dive and the number of dives uh, to depth are much greater uh, in males uh, than in females. And then the total time they spend at depth is also uh, significantly greater. And then we also found that males are uh, having more prey capture success in general, uh, which is also something interesting. The, the blue deployments are prey captured by males uh, during the D tags, and then the lavender color are the females. Um, and if this is suggestive of prey sharing, maybe the males are sharing some of their prey, maybe the males are just going and getting more fish, they have bigger bodies, they have a higher metabolic costs of just metabolic, metabolically operating because they're larger animals. So we're trying to understand that better. Um, and the uh, Northwest Fisheries Science Center team is uh, these, all of these DTAG experiments that we performed were during daylight hours. So they're re recreating this except going with overnight deployments of DTAGs so that we can understand how Southern residents may be using habitat uh, when there are less boats and what's happening if, uh, if it's, uh, are they doing foraging at night or not. So. So those, uh, that's kind of a broad overview. Uh, I wish I had better news for the Southern resident recovery. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, the animal, the population, it's a distinct population segment protected under the Endangered Species Act, and it's down to 72 animals right now. And I, I kind of think until uh, we come up with good policy that addresses the, the salmon, the lack of salmon, uh, the endangered species Chinook salmon runs and starts to get those numbers up, 
um, and uh, as until we start to uh, really quiet things down and find ways to reduce those toxin loads, I think it may be difficult for this population to recover. Uh, but I, I welcome your questions. Feel free to send me an email at uh, dave.haas at duke.edu. Uh, and thanks for listening.